Namaste. So it's a beautiful morning, still dark outside, but it's been raining since like midnight. Nice, slow, steady monsoon rains. Well, what's so special about that? It's the middle of February. <laughs> Very unusual weather for South India. Usually by this time it's sunny and hot, but we've been getting a lot of cloud cover and even rain. Why? The weather patterns are changing. Specifically, cold Arctic air is coming down into the Himalayas and even down into the plain of India. And the rain bands around the equator are moving north. Very strange, huh? It's a once in a lifetime kind of thing. But I think it's actually going to become a repeating pattern. Now, in the last video, I talked about how I'm taking a partner for a tantric exploration. So this should not be surprising, you know. I've posted so many videos, a whole series about the relationship between sex energy and self-realization. But apparently people don't really pay attention to what I'm saying or they don't understand it. I don't know. Whatever it is, there's still a lot of confusion about this, <clears throat> although there shouldn't be. Now, as I see it, as anyone who has any self-realization will see it, everyone is already enlightened, even animals. Why is that? Well, structurally, Enlightenment means being situated in Turiya consciousness and then the objects of that consciousness are the other three steps or, or qualities of consciousness, Jagrat, waking consciousness, Svapna, dreams, and Sushupti, or deep sleep. Now, as I see it, as anyone who has any self-realization sees it. Everyone is already situated in Turiya and viewing the other states of consciousness from that consciousness of Turiya. You know, it's just like changing the lenses on a camera. You ever seen one of those old style video cameras it has this rotating thing with several lenses on it. And then to go from a, a medium focus to a close up or to a telephoto, all they have to do is push a button and the thing rotates, click, click. Huh? In the same way, the Turiya consciousness is fundamental to everyone. That's like the body of the camera with the, with the photoreceptors and all that. But then the lenses, the other three states of consciousness, change. So I don't know, you know what, what is so difficult about this to grasp. We are already in Turiya watching the other states of consciousness. Well, the problem, of course, is that people are identified with those consciousness. You see? the conditioned states of consciousness. Just like Mother Lakshmi was explaining in Lakshmi Tantra that there are two levels of creation, the pure creation, the unmanifest creation, and the impure manifest creation. So similarly, we have the Turiya consciousness, which is pure by, by nature, and then we have the other three states, which are impure, conditioned. What does it mean, conditioned? Limited. 
When we are in Jagrat consciousness, for example, we are identified with the body and senses. And we think that the body and the world are real. And there's all these different, different objects. In Svapna consciousness, we think the dream is real, even though it's simply thoughts, memories. Uh -huh. And in Sushupti, we think the void is real. And of course, these are also stages of self-realization. Now, in our line, the Shakta line, we transcend all the modes of consciousness, the conditioned consciousness, and the modes of nature, the gunas, trigunya, the three modes, sattva, rajas, and tamas. We transcend them all. And thus, we remain situated in Turiya. And we also have full freedom because we're not confined to any of the modes. See, like the people who think that the mode of goodness is better than the others, mainly the Vaishnavas, they think like that. Mode of goodness leads to self-realization. Well, it can. <laughs> but not if you're attached to it. And of course, the problem is they become attached to it. They think the mode of goodness, the sattva guna, is everything. And if you're not situated in sattva guna, you have no standing in self-realization. Well, that's just not true. Huh? How is it then that the demons were able to approach Lord Shiva and get boons? See, they're not situated in goodness. Well, how is that? Because Lord Shiva does not discriminate between sattva, rajas, and tamas. It's, to him, they're all the same. They're all conditioned. They're all limited. They're all inferior to the real consciousness. See, Brahman, Turiya consciousness. So in this way the, way, the way we see it, <laughs> those people who say the, the mode of goodness, the sattva guna, is the exclusive path to realization, are themselves actually in ignorance because they're attached to one of the modes. They don't see the modes equally. They think that sattva guna is better than the others. And yeah, it says so in Bhagavad Gita. But then <laughs> Bhagavad Gita is part of Mahabharata. And in Mahabharata, it's explained in many, many places how, for example, the, the, the Yadu dynasty came into the world and in the Yadu dynasty, none of the family relations were in the mode of goodness. Huh? Those of you who know Mahabharata, you know that, for example, Vyasadeva was conceived by his father when his father was a sannyasi, right? And he was traveling, he had to cross a river. So he had to take a boat, but the boatman wasn't there. Only his daughter was there. So while being rowed across the river, this sannyasi decided he wanted to make love and conceive a son with the boatman's daughter. And she said, well, no, we can't do that. We're in the middle of the river. Everybody can see. So he used his mystical powers to create fog. Nobody could see anything. It was pea soup fog. So in that way, he made love with the, 
the boatman's daughter right in the middle of the river in the boat. <laughs> and then he went on his way. But because this was a mystical kind of thing, she immediately started to deliver the child. So she went to this island in the middle of the, of the Ganga huh? and delivered the child on the island. And afterwards, by a boon from the saint, she retained her virginity and later married. But anyway, her son, Krishna Dvaipayana Vyasa, uh, why is his name Dwaipayana? means born on an island. And then, of course, he became the father of the three uh, Pandu and Dhritarashtra. And uh, the third brother, who was not considered a Kshatriya. Uh, so, <laughs> by the, the father of those three was the uncle. See, that's also kinky, right? <laughs> and then the five Pandavas. The five Pandavas were born because Pandu got cursed. He shot a deer, a pair of deers, while making while they were making love. Huh? Another this is a weird kinky thing. And they weren't really deer. It was a Rishi and his wife. So the Rishi had a wife. He wasn't celibate either. And they were making love as deer because deer are very uh, fond of lovemaking. So with his dying breath, the Rishi cursed Pandu. The next time you have sex, you will die. So Pandu had two wives, Kunti and Madri. The Kunti had gotten a mantra, uh, a special mantra that she could call any demigod. And what she didn't know <laughs> is that when she called them, the god would have sex with her and create a child. So because Pandu couldn't have sex, then Kunti used the mantra to call the sun god, well, early, before they even got married, she called the sun god and then she had Karna. And then with Pandu, she called uh, Yamad Yamaraj and had Yudhishthir. She called Indra and had Arjun. And she called Agni and had Bhima. Then she used the mantra for Madri and called the Ashwins, the twins, Ashwins. And they conceived the twins, Nakula and Sahadev, and that is how the five Pandavas were born. So everyone in that family has a very unusual family sexual history, right? So for the Vaishnavas to claim, oh, we're following in this line, and so we only accept, you know, vanilla sex for the purpose of, of uh, uh, procreation. Right? This is astoundingly hypocritical because if you look into their own line, the Pandavas and all those people had very, very strange family histories. And they, it's like they read it in, in the Mahabharata, but they don't think about it. They don't think what it means. What it means is that the mode of goodness is not the exclusive path to self-realization. All these people, Vyasadeva, Pandu, the Pandavas, huh? they were all born in very, very strange circumstances. Right? So they're mixed modes. They're not exclusively sattvic. So this myth that to be a sannyasi or to be self-realized, you have to be an ascetic. Huh? You have to give up all worldly pleasures. You know? that, this is counteracted by so many stories in Shastra. For example, King Janaka, the mother of, uh, excuse me, the father of Sita Devi. Uh, Janaka was a great king. 
And while he was enjoying in the royal harem with his many wives and concubines, afterwards he was relaxing and he could hear the siddhas singing in the sky, rejoicing. And he could listen to them. He understood their language and their songs. And from this he realized, oh, I have to meditate. I have to become realized like that. So he took some time for meditation. And when he was complete, when he was enlightened, he continued to act as king. Right? He's, he's still engaged in battle and diplomacy and, yes, enjoyed the royal harem. Huh? Nothing changed. Why is that? Because his prarabdha karma, the, the karma that's ripened in this life, was that he was to be a king. And being self-realized doesn't change that. Ramana Maharshi was questioned about this point. And he said, someone's prarabdha karma is to become an ascetic. He's talking about himself. To become a renunciant, a sannyasi. Someone else's prarabdha karma is to be a great king or a merchant or whatever it is. And when they become enlightened, that doesn't change. What changes is only their point of view, huh? the way they see things. Because instead of identifying with the body, instead of being conditioned by the three impure states of consciousness, they adopt the viewpoint of uh, the Turiya, and they see that the object of consciousness is only consciousness. The object of unconditioned consciousness is conditioned consciousness. So there's no, no duality. Consciousness is seeing consciousness, that's all. And as far as the contents of the conditioned states of consciousness, that is all maya. It doesn't really exist. It's just an illusion, a mirage of these three gunas. See, and this is how one is raised to the pure creation. This is how one transcends not only the mode of passion and ignorance, rajas and tamas, but also the mode of sattva, goodness. They transcend all the modes. So, and this is the exclusive property of the shaktas and shaivas the followers of Shiva and the followers of Shakti. Uh, because they are given this vision, they are given this special point of view, because they are situated in Brahman. They are situated in pure consciousness. So they don't become attached to external forms. See, the religious people, the Vaishnavas and like that, are so much attached to their external forms that they become conditioned by the mode of goodness and thus they fail to attain complete self-realization. But that limitation is overcome by the Shaivas and Shaktas because they are actually situated in the pure creation beyond the modes. Om Tatsat, Om Shakti, Om.